Hey, good morning. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Bunker Office Hours, a weekly live show brought to you by the team at Bunker Labs, national network of veteran and military spouse entrepreneurs dedicated to helping our ecosystem start and grow their own businesses. I'm your host, the one and only Iron Mike Stedman, coming to you from Newark, New Jersey, joined by my co-host, Amy Morrison, and a special guest today, Mr. Charles Kearson. Mr. Charles Kearse, my apologies. What's going on, y'all? All right. How you doing, Mike? Another day, another dollar, blessed, favored, excited to be here. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, man, because you're doing some great work down in North Crackalacky, North Carolina, for those of you unfamiliar, um, working with youth and also building out an ecosystem of support through golf that we're going to be talking about. Before we do that, I got to pass it to my co-host, Amy, to talk about what's going on in the bunker. We've got a lot of tight application deadlines that are coming up. We want to make sure you guys and gals out there are applying. Cool. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes. Yeah, so like Mike said, we've got a lot of applications open uh, currently. So our veterans and residents application is, closes September 30th, this Thursday. Uh, so if you apply now, that's for the January cohort. Um, so get your apps in this week. And then we've got a new blog on the website. So new veteran uh, spotlight article up for, on Melissa Green and badass coffee causes. causes. Um, so Melissa Green uh, is a veteran, military spouse, mother of four, and uh, has her MBA, but she uh, hooked up with the Veterans and Residents Program to kick her coffee company into growth stage. She also did our Breaking Barriers in Entrepreneurship workshop, which those applications are also open. Uh, so Breaking Barriers in Entrepreneurship workshop deadline is also September 30th, and that is an eight-week virtual workshop series uh, designed specifically for female Black, Latinx, and Asian entrepreneurs. So that cohort starts in October. So the deadline or the turnaround for Breaking Barriers is always a lot tighter than veterans and residents. Um, awesome. And yep, yeah, that's, that's what we got. <laughs> Sorry. Well, appreciate it, Amy. Again, make sure y'all uh, apply if you feel like you're a good fit or you know someone who's a good fit. You know, um, people are super lonely now. They're dealing with a lot of stuff being entrepreneurs, as me and Charles were talking about before we went live. And so finding a community through either our Breaking Barriers and Entrepreneurship Workshop Series or our Veterans and Residents is a great way to not go at it alone. So, again, we'll be sure to drop the link in the chat and uh, make sure you plug it and share it. So without further ado, my man, Charles, been a pleasure. I got to hang out with you down in, um, were, we in were we in Austin, I believe? In Austin, yeah, in Austin, yes, sir. Yeah, for the um, the flying, ambassador flying that I got to come down to get some in-person interviews for the transition fellowship with all the ambassadors. It was a good time. And so it was great to uh, get reconnected on here um, and talk about what you're doing through your urban impact movement. And, uh, you know, you sent me a clip yesterday from Mike Tyson talking about uh, the neighborhood in Browns. Is it Brownville? Brownsville, um, yes, sir. Yeah, Brownsville that you grew up in. Um, you want to share some more insight into that? Yeah, Brownsville is the ville we never ran and we never will. And uh, so I grew up three blocks from I and Mike Tyson, and um, I, you know, I know I and Mike Stedman. Uh, likes boxing and the whole nine yards. And so I wanted to give you some context about how this guy, you know, you're talking to today, went from the ghetto to the golf course, right? And uh, it hadn't been easy, which, you know, entrepreneurship is not easy in and of itself. And I encourage everyone to put their applications in, apply for uh, the VIR as well as the breaking barriers. I've been through both of them actually lead the, um, the VIR here um, in Charlotte. Um, and so it is very important, you know, as we think about communities that we come from versus communities that we want to influence. And Mike talked about in that clip, how that he's a product of the community. And um, as I was saying, the difference between Mike Tyson and myself is that Mike got caught doing his dirt. I didn't get caught get doing my dirt. So I never spent any time and was fortunate enough to go um, to get out of the, the ghetto, go through college. Um, and my college career was interrupted with an injury. I played football, got a scholarship. And so uh, I wind up going to the military to get some additional money to finish college. So that's how I, I went into the army, uh, became uh, an admin of 71 Lima, company clerk, took care of the troops. 
and still doing the same thing now through entrepreneurship, training, and coaching. That's awesome. So tell us about what you got going on now, like you said, through the training and coaching. You got a lot of stuff. You got your hands in the fire. You know, as entrepreneurs, we got to have multiple different hustles because cash flow is real, right? Like, you don't feel it until you go full time. I'm telling you, all it becomes a real um, situation. I know you do your training and coaching, but then you've also been trying to create some impact through the sport of golf. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, I've been an entrepreneur for, for many of those days after, you know, being amongst the, the underground economy, we'll call it, you know, uh, hanging out with gangs and doing drugs and doing misbehaving and stuff. I, I, I emerged with uh, an epiphany that I needed to do this legally, you know, do entrepreneurship legally. So I went back and got my education, um, got, you know, a couple of degrees um, and understand, you know, business and processes and systems and what have you. But really, uh, and my heart of hearts is really to be an entrepreneur and find identify problems and monetize them by bringing them to the marketplace. And so been able to do that through coaching and training. Uh, we do a couple of things with our training is making sure that we give people uh, the proper entrepreneurial mindset, because a lot of times people just want to go in and kind of bootstrap their way and, and you know, a hook or a crook and try to make a business work. And sometimes that works because, you know, you get cash flow and you think your business is, is really uh, a scalable uh, entity. And it's not if you don't have simple systems and processes. So that's what we do with the coaching and training. We help people to kind of understand the entire life cycle of business and then come up with an exit strategy. A lot of entrepreneurs get into this stuff and they don't think about how they're going to get out. Well, you want to you don't you don't ever want to fall in love with what you do right and what and you want to you want to love what you do but not fall in love with your product or service and you need an exit strategy because if you're able to exit properly now you have the resources to think to dream of the next big thing and so that's how we help to position that and along the way i learned golf um actually using golf as a mentoring tool for my son who is now 32 so this has been 21 years ago he was 11 when i got started mentoring him and some some other inner city kids i you know we were living in the suburbs but i still have an, an affinity for the inner city urban communities and really help to shape these young boys into leaders and connect them to people that are making decisions so the one thing that golf does it connects you to decision makers and you can build relationships with those people that can give you a yes and give you a nod where your business is concerned, your career, your job, or whatever. So it's a, a tool I think that every person needs to have in their toolkit. I remember growing up, people used to say you need to learn how to play golf because that's where business is done. I've never really learned how to play golf. I probably played golf like twice in my entire life. And I remember being younger, going with some friends to a country club. I didn't even have shoes, right? I had on like jeans and a polo. They let me borrow like two clubs and I was like carrying them you know, on the field like a machine gunner, you know, and I remember feeling super embarrassed about it. And I remember feeling super self-aware because I feel like I didn't belong, if I'm being quite frank. This was some kind of fancy country club. But I'm interested in learning more about, like, what you've seen in terms of the types of relationships that are built out on these golf courses. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of things there. Um, number one, you have some on ramps on now, Mike, that you can actually use right there in Edison, New Jersey. One of the oldest top golfs in the country is right there in Edison, New Jersey. And top golf is a great on on uh, on ramp to getting people to understand how, first of all, to swing the club, hold the club and have fun. Right. You're going to go to top golf really to have fun there. I, I don't know too many people that go to Top Golf and not have fun. So that's the most important thing. And then eventually you, you matriculate. You you skipped a couple of steps to get to the country club. <laughs> so you had some friends that would invite you to the country club. And that's what's important when uh, I've got, so I moved to Charlotte three and a half years ago. And one of my partners now is a member of Charlotte Country Club. And I actually became friends with this guy. He has uh, an entrepreneurial um uh, support organization as well. I've helped him with uh, to build out ways to connect people to business opportunities. And the country club is designed for that. It's designed for you to get to know people over the course of three or four hours in a round where you're talking about, you know, life, but really you're talking about business. Now, 
most business deals aren't consummated on the golf course, but they're started through relationships. And of course, people do business with people uh, they know, trust, and like. And so that's why people need to understand the game of golf. And it's not really, you know, a game. If say, I, I talk to people all the time, it says, well, I don't even like the game. It's not what you like, it's what the people that are making decisions on your behalf to say yay or nay concerning your business deals or your promotions or your raises, those people are the ones that you want to be top of the mind. And so being in the 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 essence of golf and understanding how to play, and, and I teach people what I call business golf, right? So you've got etiquette, <clears throat> you've got ways to approach the game. Of course, you're always going to be on time. You're not going to drink a whole bunch when you're out there. You're going to have certain courtesies that you need to have. And when you do that, you get to meet individuals that, I mean, literally out of this world. If, for example, this past weekend was the President's Cup, and two, two of the former presidents showed up at the President's Cup, along with all the other big uh, CEOs, uh, all of these individuals that are making decisions, we've been able to connect to those types of individuals because we, we have the language of golf, which is also the language of business. Love it. And I saw something blowing up on LinkedIn, this African-American golf expo. Um, tell us about that because that looked super dope. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because the African-American Golf Expo, I'm not the founder of it, but I was the guy that put together a team to bring it to Charlotte, North Carolina. So the first year it was over in Atlanta um, and it was the first official year where we pulled the African-American golf uh, golfers out of this big, huge expo. Now, I'll take you back to the PGA host, uh, the PGA merchandising show every year down in Orlando in January, and the golf world comes to Orlando. So imagine 10 football fields of an expo. It's huge. And so you can imagine if it's only white guys pretty much there, everybody else, the women and the minorities, they get lost in the sauce. And so Jim Beatty, who was the founder of the African-American Golf Expo, came up with the idea. He says, well, if, if the golf industry is talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they got woke as a result of George Floyd's murder, and they're going to raise $100 million, why not pull them out into an environment where we can have intimate, small, intimate conversations with them to help to solve the issues that they have recognized? Now, mind you, up until 1961, there was a Caucasian-only clause in golf. And so the gentleman, um, Charles Sifritz, who helped, he and a bunch of his friends helped to eradicate and get rid of the clause, uh, he, he's from Charlotte. And so that was part of my motivation of bringing it here so that we can celebrate the history, but then come together and look and, and bring about a, a, a vision for the future of what golf could look like if we invite more minorities. And, and if you if you saw the, the President's Cup at all, you saw uh, our Korean brothers, um, and particularly Tom Kim pumping up the crowd. He's a 20-year-old uh, Korean guy that hits the ball a ton, can play some great golf, but he really helped to shift uh, the competition from the United States dominating to where the international started to really give, give us a fit come Sunday. And we didn't know whether or not we were gonna win. Of course, we wind up winning, but it's that kind of synergy that happens when we come together and golf being a relationship development tool, we intended to, to bring folk together and just have great conversations that we are able to do that with the African American Golf Expo and some of the other initiatives that we have around the game of golf, because it's, we're stronger together. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's really in business. That's, you know, in in, in sports or, or just in society in general, we're stronger together. And so when we work together, we can get some things done. How was that received the expo? Our oh, man, it was great. We had probably seven or eight CEOs come and uh, they they I mean, literally we had they did play golf. We played golf one day that Sunday. And, uh, you know, typically when you go to a golf out and you're going to get ha hot dogs and hamburgers, but uh, I orchestrated a soul food dish and we, you know, we had all kinds of jerk turkey and uh, barbecue chicken and um, some cabbage and some 
some peas and rice and some some uh, macaroni and cheese. And so they were like, hold on, wait, this is our environment, but you've added a twist to the element and bringing, you know, the food that other folks, the food and the music are part of the key in diversifying. So people loved it. We've got, uh, we had probably between 52 uh, to 55 sponsors and vendors. And we've got people already signing up for next year. And, and, and Mike, you would appreciate this. We're actually going to the home of uh, Muhammad Ali, Louisville, Kentucky next year, where we'll have uh, next year's uh, expo. That's great, man. And let me tell you all, if you've never done event planning, it ain't no joke. And to do it <laughs> while being an entrepreneur is a whole nother beast. You know, and I don't know how you were able to do it, man. That's a lot of moving parts. But one thing I love seeing on social was the amount of support you got from the bunker community. You know, I saw Nisla down there. I saw some other people. And for me, you know, out here in Newark, man, that like warmed my heart. You start to see us all coming together and supporting one another, you know, as veteran entrepreneurs and military spouses. Yeah, and that that's the only way we can do it. You know, we had uh, Nisla come. We had... Um, uh simon come we had kim we had um you know we we had a bunch of support from the bunker community but it's the teamwork that makes the dream work right so you know i might come up with these great ideas but i'm always trying to pull people in and the great example of that one of the one of our volunteers roosevelt uh roosevelt came in had no no didn't know anything about golf he came out to uh volunteer for the expo but then I also um, invited him to come out to the President's Cup. And man, I've, I've developed a lifelong friend and a partner with this guy simply because, again, he's getting exposed to something that he heard about. Because most people here, you do great business deals. You do greater business deals on the golf course than you do the boardroom. But then they don't know how. So what we do is teach them the art of business golf and teaching them how. And it's just showing up and being friendly, meeting people and connecting with people and telling people what you do, you know, how you can help them. And then, you know, really developing that relationship over time is the key, right? A lot of times people aren't in it for the long haul. And, and we know that entrepreneurship, you've got to be in it for the long haul, even though you might need to make pivots along the way. But it's the relationships, never burn bridges, always build great relationships and build the relationships before you need them. Right. So that's what golf affords you the opportunity to do. And then, you know, that's one of the things that we do with our training and coaching is we're like, OK, if you're in this for the long haul, now let's put in the processes and the systems. Let's make sure that you you are part of the community to include your own family. Right. That's going to support you in the long haul, because you may I mean, you may you don't know when you're going to get your big win, you know, as an entrepreneur. Right. And, and you just got to be in it. You can't be up and down. You just can't throw, throw in the towel and quit. Now, speaking of that, before we went live, you and I were talking about how hard, you know, entrepreneurship really is right for both of us. Can you let our pe let the people know what it's really like? Because, again, you got a lot of viewers that are tuning in. They might feel like I don't know that uh, um, th it's only hard for them. Right. Like, mm -hmm. why is it so hard for me? Woe is me. When in reality, we're all kind of going through the similar stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's it's very difficult. Um, and, and particularly, I, I tell my entrepreneurs that I coach and train, I says, here's the key to being successful in entrepreneurship. It's going to be tough, number one. So you might as well get ready for it and develop the right mindset for it and then be committed to growing yourself. If you're committed to growing yourself, doing the disciplines that's necessary to grow you, then eventually you'll be able to grow an enterprise and not think that you're going to just be, you know, this overnight wonder. You know, a lot of times when you have success, people are like, man, you're an overnight success. And you say, like for me, you're that was the longest night of my life, considering, you know, I've been doing this entrepreneurship thing for 45 years. The first 30 years, you know, I had some great success in the nonprofit sector. But then when I, I pivoted and wanted to really penetrate this $100 billion golf industry that's predominantly white industries, like, hold on, wait, it, it, the, the greatest needle mover to this game still is Tiger Woods. And so there's some real opportunity here. Let's figure it out. And as we figure it out, then we're able to invite more people in, which means that, yeah, it's still going to be difficult. And, and part of the most difficult part of it is cash flow. 
right? Because your cash flow is like a, it's like this, you know, you don't know when it's going to come in. You got, you might do great work and you've got uh, uh, folk that are going to supposed to pay you. <laughs> I'm waiting for checks right now, right? But they're going through the same thing that, that I'm going through. They got to determine whether or not they're going to pay that most expensive grocery bill, like groceries are off the chain right now. Food cost is so high or they're going to pay me. Well, if they got kids, they're going to pay me last and I'm going to get right. paid because I'm going to keep my relationship alive with them and let them know, hey, I understand. But that's probably one of the most difficult things. And then, you know, just funding, uh, Mike, you know, as African-Americans, a lot of times you look at investment capital, we don't get a whole bunch of that investment capital. So we've got to be um, wise enough to bootstrap and, and figure out alternative ways to fund our ventures because the Silicon Valley model just may not work for us. Now, I know some some folks that have hit it big uh, and, and they've got that Silicon Valley stuff, but, you know, and, and they they raise enough money where they can give as founders, they give themselves a salary, but that's that's an anomaly. You know, that's not the case with most folks, you know, you, you, I mean, you're eating a whole bunch of ramen noodles and, you know, cheese and crackers and making it happen until it really happens for you. And that's why you need a community. And that's what Bunker's here for, uh, to give you that support, that community, and also to make some calls, right? Make some connections for you that you may not be able to make for yourself. Yeah, man, 100%. It's real, y'all. And I want y'all to know we got you. Yeah, listen, ain't no, ain't no faking it here at the bunker. We keep it real, man. I'm telling y'all, it's a grind. And you do got to play that long game. And, you know, just like you said about self-help and investing in yourself, man, I done probably spent, of, of all the money I've made, I probably invested about 100% of it back into myself through, like, yep. business coaching, reading books, materials, all kind of stuff, just to make it less difficult. It's still hard, right? But I've noticed that when I invest in myself – I'm experiencing it a little different, you know what I yeah. mean? Um, but it is a it is a grind nonetheless. Now, Charles, man, it's been great having you today. We got to talk about books. What book recommendation do you have for our viewers today? Well, for me, I'm reading um, a book by Randall Pickens, um, Black uh, Black Faces and White Places. And you no, know, that's my professor, by the way. Not oh, Peter, is he? But uh, Jeffrey Robinson. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, He's a professor here at the business school. I took his uh, um, um, social entrepreneurship class. That is my guy. I just ran into him the other day, and I actually he gave me an advanced copy of the book, like on printout paper before it went out. Wow. Yeah. So, so those I, I've been following Randall for for a long time, and particularly because I teach entrepreneurship and on the college level, and he has a book, um, Campus CEO. Right. And so this guy is a practitioner, even though he's an academia. I mean, he's got three doctorates or something like real smart guy, much smarter than ever I will ever be. But these guys are doing it in Newark, doing it in places that I think entrepreneurship is so important. So that book, uh, because I work with his new newer book, uh, Black Faces and White Places, I work with a lot of corporate folks that are thinking about their next move. Right. So. You know, you can become a corporate. Charlotte has a lot of corporate millionaires. But the thing about being a corporate millionaire, you can't will that to that that position to your children. So I encourage people to actually start something on the side and have a side gig. And, and Dr. Pickens uh, in his book, he helps people to understand how to, to navigate the corporate world, but then also to make sure that you have that entrepreneurial mindset and you have something on the side that that you can now exit if you desire to or if you're forced to yeah right because there's no guarantee in corporate neither right it's hard in corporate it's hard in entrepreneurialism uh and, and as we work together you know the way to make um uh small businesses who hire 70 to 85 percent create 70 to 85 percent of new jobs is working with big corporations because they have resources, they have needs, and that's what we're doing with the golf industry. The golf industry is saying, hey, we want to diversify. And we're saying, well, we want to help you diversify. So let's work together. And as we continue to grow, and again, it's relationships, so it's going to take time. And we've got to grow together. And as we work together, we're going to see, um, I, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 
a little, probably a, a little older than you. <laughs> yeah, you I'm, said you've been an entrepreneur 45 years. I was like, I'm not even 45. I'm like 35. I, I started when I was 14, man. Yeah. So when, when, when I was going against Mike Tyson and all that stuff back in the hood, Mike is three years younger than me, right? And so yeah. I'm, you know, I've been around for a minute, but here's the, the, the key is us coming together, right? us working together and then celebrating the diversity that that comes as a result of us coming together and working together and i think that the military and, and bunker uh we do that really well because we, we're from all different different backgrounds we have different perspectives we see the world differently but we celebrate our differences right instead of just um being an antagonistic against each other and you're wrong i'm right no nah, all of us, we've got both the good and the bad and the wrong and the right. And now as we come together to make things happen, um, I think we're going to see, we're going to, we're going to make this world, and this is the goal, make the world a better place than we found it. Love it, man. And if we can do that, we're going to be good. Yeah. And I'll tell you, man, Pinkett and Dr. Robinson were beasts. They both got degrees out the wazoo. They were roommates at Rutgers. Yeah. Dr. Robinson went on to get his PhD from Columbia, came back to Rutgers. Like, he's the man. He's, like, top of the food chain, you know, out here. So I got to definitely check out that book. And uh, I'm reading um, Succeeding Against the Odds by John H. Johnson. I'm actually listening to that book on Audible. John H. Johnson was the founder of Ebony Magazine, Jet. He talks about that story. And he records the audio book himself. And so it's just such a gem getting poured into, you know, by these individuals, man. That's why I always tell people, you got to read, you got to listen in the audio books. They put us on some game that they've been passing along. And I just, for me, as a, as a, as a black male in Newark, feeling like I'm up against the odds myself, right? I love hearing these inspirational stories from people that look like me. I feel like I have that agency, you know? I feel like I can relate yeah. to a lot yeah. of it. And I've been going out of my way a lot more recently to find all those books, you know, uh, Reginald F. Lewis is another one, yeah. you know, one of the first yeah. billionaires. And so there's just tons of great content out there that I want to encourage you all, um, to make sure that you're diving, um, into because some of these books you got to go look for, right. They ain't going to yeah. pop up on, you know, the ink 50 books or whatever. So you got to talk to people like, you know, me and Charles to get the game. Hey Mike, there's on my bookshelf there. Um, it says black history. It's called BH365. It's a, a five and a half pound black history book. And it talks about the success of, of black historians um, all throughout the years, even pre-slavery. A lot of times people talk about it starts with slavery, but there's so much success in our race and there's so much success in our community that we don't celebrate. And if we take the time to, as you say, to read ourselves strong and making sure that we're building ourselves up and then we're able to overcome the the obstacles because they're going to be obstacles but what i like to tell people and, and i played football i played collegiate football and i was a fullback and my coach would pound a particular play until that spot would open up for us and then eventually it opened up and we'd get a, a touchdown and that's what it is being an entrepreneur you pound a spot you pound a spot and eventually the toughness of the spot it will make you harder and tougher, resilient, make you into a diamond because you're able now to accomplish what it is that you have in your heart. But if you think it's gonna be easy, well, it's really not gonna be worth it if it's as easy, right? But if, if you're tough and, and the tough times, cause tough times don't last what tough people do, now you're able to, to get through it. And, and particularly when you're talking to people of like-mindedness, right? We, we know that entrepreneurship is not easy because everybody would be in the game if, they, if it was. But it takes a resiliency, a certain mindset, and a certain heart to do it. And then a heart beyond the money, right? We're not doing this just for money like Mike, what you're doing there in um, Newark, you know, with your boxing gym and, and helping young kids and stuff like that. We don't do this just for money. We do it to make a difference, right? I tell people there are three things that I like to do. I like to have fun, make money, and make a difference. And making the difference is the big thing. You can't make a difference if you don't make no money. And you can't yeah. have much fun without no money, especially up in the Northeast, right? <laughs> 100%. And we want to appreciate y'all for tuning in. I got about 10 seconds to close this out. I got to make sure I plug the Transition Podcast. 
did an episode, The Cost of Doing Business with Daniel Gomez. That is real. Listen to that podcast. As soon as you get off of this, go ahead and hit subscribe, like it, and drop us a review on iTunes. I'd also like to acknowledge our event sponsors for today, MetLife Foundation for their commitment to supporting veteran and military spouses uh, transitioning into the workforce and through entrepreneurship. We couldn't do this platform or the transition without the support of MetLife Foundation. Head over to BunkerLabs.org, get plugged into our ecosystem. We got programs that'll take you from idea to invoice, incubate you, and position you alongside other founders and CEOs. Charles, it's been a pleasure chopping up with you today. Until yes, next time, everyone, peace, love, and have a great rest of your week.